Go tell it on the mountain. The one that we've been waiting for. The King of our salvation. Born on this day, our Savior Christ the Lord. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere that we can be forgiven. The weight of all our sin he came to bear. Emmanuel, God with us, Emmanuel, King Jesus, Savior of the world is born. Emmanuel, God with us, Emmanuel, King Jesus, Savior of the world is born. Go tell it on the mountain, humbly in a major day, mercy sent from heaven, angels Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. True. 
joy, unspeakable joy, overflowing well, no tongue can tell, joy, unspeakable
this time, bless Pastor, fill him with your spirit, Lord, as he brings your word to us. We thank you so much for the wonderful and mighty things that are about to happen. In your name, amen. We're, we're in a series titled uh, The Heart of Christmas, and um, I think sometimes we lose exactly what the heart of Christmas is. The heart of Christmas is Jesus. I mean, that's the reason for the season. We say that, but do our lives really reflect that? And I, like I told you at the beginning, Right off the bat, this message is for every single person that's here and every single person that's going to hear this message. I was surprised when I looked at my own heart that I was struggling with this issue. I want to start out this morning with our foundational verse, which is Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. I'm reading out of the NIV this morning. It says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. This is so key that we remember that this is the reason that Jesus came to the earth. At Christmas time, we think of the little manger scenes and, oh, it's so sweet and all the animals around and everything else. We forget that Jesus came for one purpose. That purpose was to deliver us from sin and to reunite us, reconnect us with God. And what we've been discovering or maybe... um, rethinking is that this world is not our home we act like it's our home we hang on to it like it's our home but the reality is this world is not our home the first message that we had which was um, hope is in the heart of christmas we we looked at putting our hope in jesus rather than our things it's hard for us to give up our stuff we don't want to give up things. We don't, want to get, we don't want to unload things. But Jesus came to free us up. Last week we looked at having peace at the heart of Christmas. And we discovered that peace really comes through obedience. It's hard to have peace in your heart when you're rebelling against God. Today, I want to talk about joy. 
joy. Well, pastor, why is that such a bad subject? It's not a bad subject. It's a great subject. But there's something that I think we need to look at when it comes to joy. First off, you can put this on the screen. Joy is not a feeling. It is a knowledge. Joy isn't a feeling. Happiness is a feeling. Oh, I'm so happy I won the lotto. Oh, something good happened to me. I'm so happy. Oh, I'm so happy, right? But what happens when something bad comes into your life? The happiness leaves, and it's replaced with sorrow or sadness or hurt. And I believe that joy is something that can only come through God and His Holy Spirit, true joy. Like you might experience moments of joy when your children are born, but even that isn't the type of joy that Jesus wants us to have. And there's a problem that most of us have that's keeping us from joy. That's keeping us from the joy that God wants us to have. If you would open up your Bibles or your tablets or whatever you have, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, and I want to start in verse 14. The Hebrew writer writes, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Now, I want you to notice the first thing that the writer says. He says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Let me just say right off the bat, some people take more effort than others. There are people in your lives and in my life where it's an effort to live peaceably with them. And so he says, make every effort to do this. Why? Because it's, it's, what, it's a mark of holiness for us. The second thing that the writer says, he says that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. In other words, church, we have to let go of bitterness We have to let go of bitterness in our lives. To be at peace peace with others, bitterness must go. To have joy, bitterness must go. Here's the key. You can't have peace and joy if you have bitterness in your heart. I'll say that again. You cannot have peace and joy if you have bitterness in your heart. The title of today's message is Joy is in the Heart of Christmas. This is going to blow you away. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this morning. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our minds, God. Father, may we just listen to your voice. I thank you for what you're going to do today, God. I believe this is a life-altering message for all of us. And so, Lord, thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said, I'm convinced of one of the spiritual enemy's greatest tools that he possesses is to destroy relationships and to poison hearts. The Bible calls this a root of bitterness. This is what the Hebrew writer is saying in Hebrews chapter 12. And you have to understand that the enemy's tactics, Satan's tactics, are opposite of God's. God wants you to love. Right? We know that. He wants you to love. The enemy wants to kill love. He wants to kill it. God wants you to grow in intimacy. The enemy wants to destroy intimacy. God wants you to trust. The enemy wants to steal trust and leave you bitter. And I believe this with all my heart, and the Bible backs it up. The enemy will do everything possible to plant a seed of offense that creates a root of bitterness. He's good at his job. He's subtle at what he does. Could be a small thing. You're following somebody on Instagram. You're always hitting like. You're always hitting like. You're always hitting like. And then that one time you make a comment that isn't a like, and they unfollow you. And you're like, whoa. Or you send a text message. And the, the text is ignored. You see the little bubbles going because you know that they're, they're typing or thinking about typing, right? But they don't respond. Maybe it's a, a Christmas meal or a dinner, and the person never brings anything, but they bring Tupperware to take everything home, right? Yeah. 
Maybe it's a little more than that. Maybe somebody lied to you. Maybe somebody deceived you or talked bad about you. And that seed of bitterness is starting to take root in your heart. Maybe you have a relative that's always critical of your parenting, the way you spend money, um, man, your faith in God, your service in the church. Maybe it's even worse than that. Somebody's taken real advantage of you, maybe done something really bad to you. They've really misled you. They've betrayed you. They've hurt you at the very core, at the very root of your being. Let me just start out by saying this, church, if you can put this up there. You can't control what people do, but you can control how you respond. This is so key, and we forget this. People always want me to react a certain way. And I've learned through the years that typically when I want to react like people want me to react, it's not going to be a God thing. It's going to be a bad thing because I can get in the way very easily. And if you've noticed that this time of year, it tends to magnify everybody's emotions. Like Christmas just has that way of just either bringing you up or bringing you down. When times are good, Christmas makes things feel even better. It's like, oh, I love this time of year, right? But man, when there's family tension, relational hurts, disappointments, it seems to magnify at Christmas also. And the hard or lonely or broken times are often way more painful for you. And when you think about it, church, in the next week or so, many of you will have the opportunity the God-given opportunity to share His love with some of the most important people in your life, your family. And you want to share the love of Christ with them because you want them to have what you have. And you can be sure of this, that while you're doing that, your enemy will likely try to plant seeds of offense that create roots of bitterness in you and how they respond to you. Because a lot of my family members, they don't respond very favorably when I start talking about Jesus. I'll say it again. You can control, you can't control what people do, but you can control how you respond. And here's the thing about bitterness. The problem with bitterness, and there's really two problems with it that I want to bring out, that were in the scripture this morning. First off, bitterness has a dangerous root. Bitterness has a dangerous root. I'm going to say it one more time. Bitterness has a dangerous root. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 said, See to it that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble. Now, what do we know about the root of bitterness? Well, let me use an analogy. We all know that roots grow underground. They grow underground. They're, they're, sometimes you'll see some roots that'll come up to the top. But for the most part, with a tree, everything's underneath. You can't see it. So in other words, bitterness is an underground job. It's underground. It's beneath the surface. And no one sees the root growing. In fact, you may have experienced a hurt, a disappointment, an offense, or a perceived offense, right? And you may not even know that the offense has taken root. As I was putting this message together over the week, I'm thinking, well, I don't have any bitterness in my heart with people, Lord. I mean, I think I'm cool. And then the Holy Spirit starts going, really? Really? So I'm going to be very honest with you this morning. I do have bitterness in my heart that God is trying to root out. And you guys will think it's the stupidest thing in the world. It's the stupidest thing in the world. But I'll tell you, I I realized I had a root of bitterness of this. And it's people in the church who don't punt things back where they belong. It drives me batty. I get tired of it. You'll get it close. A knife goes in the the drawer, you'll put it on the counter. Right? You get uh, the trash is right by the trash thing, you leave it on the top, and it won't go on the bottom. And I need, I need to clarify something I said two weeks ago about the children's ministry. I had two thoughts in my mind when I was saying it, and it didn't come out right. I put the two thoughts as one, and I messed up. And I went back and I listened, and I was like, eh, that's not what I meant. At one point, the children's ministry had a lot of stuff. Stuff that I felt we did not need. Stuff that the people in the children's ministry felt they did not need. They did a great job of purging everything. In fact, when we came here, we came here very light. 
compared to what we used to have in the children's ministry over there, and it's been a blessing, and they continue to purge. On the other side of the coin, everybody thinks that the children's ministry is a dumping ground for everything. I go into the children's ministry closet, and it's full of stuff, and I'm like, this is the children's ministry. It is not a storage facility. Storage goes behind the walls, and I know it's difficult, but this is what we do. That was in my heart. It was driving me crazy. And the Lord says, whoa, dude, chill out, man. In the big picture, not a big deal. But to me, it is a big deal because this is God's house. And I'm so meticulous about the chairs and everything. Why? Because God is meticulous. He keeps every planet in place. He keeps every star where it's supposed to be. He keeps every tree growing. He keeps, the, he keeps the ocean in its place. So I should be able to keep this little house here in its place. So, you know, I'm just, and then the Lord's going, oh, dude, you got a problem. Well, here's the thing, church, is that bitterness can get in our hearts and we don't even realize it's a bitterness. We think we're justified to feel a certain way. But when you really think about it, when you really transition things in your heart and your mind, and you really line it up with Scripture, well, our attitude should be different. My attitude should be be different. Because if I look at things, let's say in light of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if I go to verse 4, let's see what it says. Love is patient, love is kind. Hmm. It's not, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Here's the one. It keeps no record of wrongs. That's what love does. That's love. See, when I'm patient and kind, right, when I don't envy, when I'm not boasting about myself, when I'm not proud, when I'm not dishonoring others, when I'm not self-seeking, when I'm not easily angered, and I'm not keeping wrongs, that's love. And let me tell you something. Bitterness is just the opposite. It keeps a detailed record of wrongs. And that's what I was doing. I was tallying up all the times when I'm like, oh, man, now i got to go do this real quick. Look at this. This is a mess, whatever, right? I'm tallying up these wrongs. And the Lord's like, dude, man, you're way out of pocket on this, man. You're way out of pocket. And my issue was a small issue. Some of you may are dealing with bigger ones. Maybe somebody hurt you, really hurt you, really misled you, really lied to you, really let you down. Well, you know, there's a problem in all of this. And here's the problem. The longer you allow a root to live, the more it spreads and the harder it is to kill. I'll give you an example. I took a tree down in my backyard last year. Well, I didn't do it. I had somebody remove it. And here's the thing. The roots are still growing underneath the ground, and they're still producing these little small saplings that come up, and i got to cut them all the time. So when they cut the tree down, they ground the stump, so everything looks good. I mean, the stump is gone. You wouldn't even hardly know there was a tree there, right? So it helped on the surface, but underneath, the roots were still alive. And this is what we do. This is how we deal with it. On the outside, oh, I'm good. Everything's good. I've I've smoothed it all out, man. I'm not angry. I'm not bitter no more. But on the inside, it's still growing. Why? Because you haven't dealt with the real root of the problem. So bitterness has a dangerous root. And secondly, bitterness produces a poisonous fruit. The other part of Hebrews Chapter uh, 15 or 12, 15 says this. It says, see that no bitter root grows up to do what? Cause trouble and defile many. Listen, bitterness just isn't a root. It's a root that produces bad fruit. It causes trouble. It defiles those who are around you. You've all seen it. That bitter person that can poison an event or a ministry. They're so poisonous. They come in, they have so much bitter. They don't even realize they're bitter. And they blow the whole thing up. A bitter person can make a workplace miserable. How many of y'all got bitter people at your workplace, right? A bitter person can divide a family. 
And I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, some of you are probably thinking, I hope so-and-so is listening because they need this message. Well, I got news for you. Before you relax and point the finger at everybody else, remember this. Bitterness is one of the most difficult sins to see in the mirror. It's one of the most difficult. Why? Because when you're bitter, you feel justified in how you feel. I'm only angry because of what they did. I'm only upset because they didn't follow through. I'm, I'm only bitter because this has been going on for so many years of my life. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If you and I aren't careful, some of us in this room this morning and with an earshot of my voice are going to celebrate the love of Christ on Christmas morning, hating someone in your heart. And you're going to receive God's grace on Christmas morning. But you're going to receive it without those around you. And so this morning, I want you to honestly ask yourself, do you have a root of bitterness? Are you holding a grudge, carrying a hurt, nursing an offense? Maybe it's the brown noser at work. Oh, you're just so sick of the brown noser, you know? Maybe the boss doesn't appreciate you and, and you're tired of not being appreciated. Maybe you're sick and tired of being criticized. Ooh, man, I know that one. I get criticized. Ooh. It's part of the job. Maybe you're mad at yourself, man. Maybe you're mad at yourself. Maybe you're bitter at yourself because of who you are and the way you act and the way you think. And that bitterness can take root and destroy you. Maybe you're disappointed or angry with God and you've got a root of bitterness with him. Church, I implore you this morning to ask yourself, do you have a root of bitterness? Because I'm going to tell you, you probably do. Because I was shocked when I started evaluating my life. I just shared with you one thing, right? Because, see, I'm not afraid to sit up here and say, hey, you know what? Your pastor's not perfect. Your pastor's a mess. Because I want to be free. I want to be free of bitterness. I want to be free of those things that are hindering me and holding me down. And I want the same thing for you. And when we can come to church and be open and honest with each other, not arrogant and not making excuses. That drives me crazy when you want to make an excuse for how you are. There's no excuse for how you are because God desires for you to change. So instead of making an excuse, go to your father and say, man, Lord, change me in this area of my life. Because God wants us to keep growing and changing. So question, how do you kill the root of bitterness? How do you kill it? How do you kill this, this root, this thing that's unseen, it's under the surface? On the outside, you're faking it. You're, you're, you've got everybody convinced, but on the inside, you're tore up. Well, how do you do it? Well, I'll tell you how. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4. If you go to verse 31, he writes, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So how do you kill it? First off, you kill bitterness with compassion. Compassion. This week, at the beginning of the week, I, Monday I was uh, up early and I was going, starting to go through my notes and everything, and I realized, like, man, Lord, I'm not really right there in this, in this area. And so I called up a friend, or I think I texted him, I can't remember, and I said, hey, dude, I need you to pray for me to have a compassionate and kind and gentle spirit, that that would be the foremost thing that, that, that comes out with me. Why? Because prayer changes me. When you guys are praying, trust me, it helps. Now, you need to understand, Paul was giving direct teaching to believers in Ephesus. This isn't to non-believers. He's talking to those inside the body of Christ. And so compassion is how you get rid of bitterness. Bitterness is the first thing that's mentioned in this verse. He says, what? Get rid of it. 
Because bitterness causes A lot of these other things. Bitterness causes rage and anger. When people are angry and raging, I go, that's a bitter person, man. That's a bitter person. Why? Because the Bible tells me that. I'm not making an assessment on my own. I'm saying the Bible tells me, get rid of all bitterness, and then after that it says rage and anger. You have to understand, when the Bible was written in the original language, it it was written with the thought, and then kind of this is the result of the thought. So when people are angry and brawling and slandering and they're doing all these other types of things, that typically comes from a bitter heart. Paul taught something similar in Romans chapter 12, verse 21. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Church, how many of us in this room, and I've been guilty of it, return evil for evil? We're called to return evil with good. Why? Because I can't control what someone else does, but I can control how I respond. And you would have a lot less conflict in your life, a lot of you, if you learn this principle. Stop being so reactionary. We're called to respond, not react. Difference between the, the reacting and responding. You hit me, I hit you, that's a reaction. You hit me and I think, What's going to be the outcome of this? Am I going to get hurt? Are they going to get hurt? Am I going to go to jail? Whatever. I respond. Church, we need to respond. And here's the thing. We need to have grace for each other. We need to encourage each other. And one of the things I've learned through the years is if I'm going to make a mistake about others, I'm always going to err on the side of believing the best. Because, see, Christ is who guides my life, and Christ is who guides your life, and he loves you so much. And so we need to err on the side of grace with each other. Stop thinking the worst of each other. My gosh, the conversations that I sometimes hear where you guys are just tearing each other up, and I go, that's not who we're supposed to be. That's what the world does. We're supposed to love each other and and reflect who God is in our lives. Jesus said it best. He said in Luke chapter 6, verse 28, he said, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Wow. Church, I'm going to tell you something right now. One of the best ways to show compassion is to pray for someone who hurts you. That's true compassion. That's true compassion. I love what a pastor said years ago. Your prayer for others may or may not change them, but it will always change you. It will always change you. It will always change me. When I'm praying for others, you, that person may not change, but I can tell you I will change because I've been in the presence of God and I've been seeking God's heart. And I've been praying blessing over that person, not God, change that attitude. No, God, bless that person. Show them your love. Show them your grace, Lord. And as you show them your love and your grace, God, that heart will begin to change. So we kill bitterness with compassion. And then Paul said that we kill bitterness with forgiveness. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Some of you have been severely hurt and injured in your lives from other people. And this is where it can get real tense, man. This is where it can get real. Because inside your mind right now, you're saying, you don't have any idea what they did to me. That's how you feel. And it's real. So how do I forgive what seems unforgivable? Well, Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, he says, get rid of all bitterness. And then in verse 32, he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other what just as in Christ God forgave you. How do you forgive? You forgive just like Jesus forgave you. And how did Jesus forgive you? He forgave you freely, generously, absolutely, entirely, and unconditionally. That's how, man, I'm, I'm preaching hard on your praise, and let's go. I'm telling you right now. That's real right there, man. Some of you are sitting there, and you're sulking because 
You're being told that you have a bitter heart. Get off the sulking and get real. Jesus is a loving Savior who wants us to change. But we have to reflect what he's done in our lives, church, and it's not easy. Do not let a root of bitterness grow up and hurt you and hurt others, because this is what happens. When you're bitter, trust me, you hurt yourself and you hurt others. Bitter people hurt everybody around them. They lash out. They say unkind things. They, 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 they act irrationally. And we're not to do that. Church, you can relive it. You can rehearse it. Like how many of you get upset with somebody, man, you're rehearsing in your mind what you're going to say to them. Oh, I'm going to light that person up like a Christmas tree. Boy, oh, when I get a hold of them. Oh, rah, 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 rah. Right? I don't really think that's God. God's had to really change my heart in that area because I used to be very extremely confrontational about things. And what I mean by that is, is I would come and talk to you and I'd let you know how I felt. Well, who cares how I feel? I need to care about how God feels about the situation. How does Jesus feel about the situation? So you can either relive it or rehearse it, or you can release it. You can release it. You can release it. Well, what if, the wrong, what if the someone who wronged you said they're not sorry, and they could care less? I don't care how you feel. I'm not sorry for what I did. Ooh, I'm going to hit you with this one. Boom. Forgive them even if they're not sorry. Oop, didn't come up. Must not have gave it to you. Mic drop. <laughs> Forgive them even if, they say, even if they're not sorry. Forgive them. Someone said, and I don't know who this was, it was a quote I found, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover the prisoner is you. Think about that. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover the prisoner is you. It's all of us. We become imprisoned when we don't forgive because it binds us up. Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, the Father won't forgive you. What does he mean by that? It's, we build these barriers up. And they insulate us and they hurt us. Romans 12, 18, it says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If, it is, if it's possible, do it. As far as it depends on you, don't be the one to initiate strife. Don't be the one when strife is initiated that you got to feel like you got to retaliate. No, I'm a man first and all that. No, you're a Christian first. You're a Christ follower first. Your humanity is secondary to who Jesus is. Because you can't control what others do, but you can control how you respond. Well, pastor, it seems like you're preaching about peace again. Where's the joy part of this at? Well, I am preaching about peace. But here's the thing. Peace brings joy, and joy brings peace. The two go together. And if you're carrying a root of bitterness, joy is impossible. Not the fullness of joy that you should have in Christ. The root has to be removed. Why? Because it's a dangerous root that produces fruit or, or, or poisonous fruit. And you've got to kill it with compassion and forgiveness. Again, going back to what Paul said in Ephesians 4.31, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. As far as is possible with you, live at peace and forgive. And when you live at peace, you'll have joy. Paul reminds us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Bitterness is a bad fruit, church, but joy is a good fruit, and it comes from the Spirit, and it comes from a spirit of love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and then these things are the byproducts of that, joy and peace. You see how they go together? When you allow the Holy Spirit to have domain over your heart, then you will have joy that goes beyond anything you can comprehend. 
A joy that will change your circumstances. A joy that draws others to you and to Jesus. Joy that is contagious. You ever been around that person that's so joyful, he just rubs off on you? Church, Jesus came to bring us joy. He came to bring us joy. He took our sins at the cross to set us free. And this should bring us joy at the very thought of that. I mean, I can't believe that Jesus would die for me because I know the type of person I am. I know the type of person I can be. But yet Jesus, Paul says, even before you knew Christ, he died for you in the condition that you were. How can we not have joy over that, church? We should have, man, our joy should just be so rooted in our hearts that stuff shouldn't bug it. It shouldn't bother me that I got to go put stuff in the garbage can and clean that. It shouldn't bother me. That tells me that my joy is incomplete. Jesus came to uproot that which is destructive in our lives, and set us free. Bitterness needs to be uprooted so that nothing hinders us from the love of God. Your bitterness this morning is keeping you from God's full love. I'm telling you now. And when God's love is at the forefront of our lives, joy will overtake us. It will overtake us, church. Joy is in the heart of Christmas. And we need to get that joy. But some of you this morning, you're going to have to take time to get with God and ask God to get rid of that root of bitterness that's there. Because it is. You'll be surprised if you just let God have you. You'll be surprised what God will show you. And suddenly Christmas will look different. When we sing joy to the world, we'll really mean it. We won't just be mouthing some words. We'll really mean it because that joy will be in our heart. Because Jesus came to set us free. He came came to set us free from bitterness and bring us joy that's incomprehensible. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this word today. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you for showing me, God, just the dark areas of my life, man. I'm so thankful, God, you love me enough to not let me stay in the same condition I am. That you love my brothers and sisters enough to not let them stay in the condition they are. That if we're open and honest with you, Lord, you will reveal to us things that we've never seen. And we'll be changed. We want to look so much like you, Jesus. We want to think like you and act like you, Lord. But there's just stuff that we got to just get off of us, Lord. I pray this morning, Lord, for my brothers and sisters who may be dealing with a root of bitterness that, Father, you would meet them where they're at, that you would love them, that you would um, just pour your grace on them. And, Lord, that they would just realize that uh, what's in there is destructive. And if it doesn't bring us closer to you, Lord, then it shouldn't be in our lives. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, all the church said, Amen, amen.